Well, tonight we're going to discuss Nordic mythology. Uh, as we you know from this group, we do study other cultures quite a bit. Part of one of the things we do, the International Gnostic Association of Anthropological Studies. This is part of that anthropological <laughs> studies. You know, uh, Buddhism is a big part of this group with karma and that kind of teaching. And obviously the Hebraic tradition has been a big part of this group with the tree of life. And now we're going to look a little bit at Nordic mythology, which is quite interesting. And if you, if you um, study Nordic mythology, one of the interesting things is that even if you study it from the scholars who spend their lives studying it, they, they don't really agree with each other on what the stories mean, what they represent. There's a, not really a concise definition of what they believe these stories were trying to represent. So that way it leaves us more room to analyze it Gnostically. So we'll start off with a quote from Samael. We can consider the German Edda to be the Germanic Bible. This archaic book contains the occult knowledge of the Nordics. It is urgent to study the Germanic Eddas. And we're going to look at what the Eddas are right now. The Eddas are considered the primary texts for the study of Northern mythology and are divided into two separate books. The first one is called the Elder or the Poetic Edda which was the oral tradition of the Icelandic people that was eventually written down anonymously around this time frame, and the second book being the Younger, or Prose Edda, which was written by the Icelandic poet and scholar Snorri Sturluson, 1200 Common Era. So we've seen this concept in other traditions, the Hebraic, for example, where they had a written tradition and an oral tradition. The Elder, the, poetic, the elder or the Poetic, we'll call it the, the Poetic Edda, is the oldest. It was their oral, oral tradition. It was much older than this time period. That's just when it eventually became written down. And so it has a lot of the stories we're familiar with. But it's also written kind of strangely and it's kind of hard to decipher because it was written for a group of people who seemed to be already familiar with the story. So there wasn't a lot of background information on the characters. It was like if we were to write stories about Jesus but not go into his whole background because we assume that this culture knows some of the background. That's how the Elder Edda was written. The Younger, or the Prose Edda, uh, it was written more easily to understand. And it filled a lot of the gaps that were in the Elder Poetic Edda, making the stories more cohesive, making them make more sense. So these two texts are where we get pretty much everything we know about the Nordic mythology. Uh, our culture, the stuff that we think we know about Nordic mythology is from plays and operas, but the actual books are the Poetic Edda and the Prose Edda. And if you're interested in reading them, there's a great site online that you can actually read these. It's called uh, sacredtext.com. It has lots and lots of awesome information. But if you go to sacredtext.com, it's under Icelandic, and then you can read it for yourself. Very interesting. It, they're, they're quite big volumes, <laughs> so we're only going to look at a couple stories or myths today. But the themes of interest that are contained in these two books are the creation story, Odin's quest for knowledge, the discovery of the runes, which is their alphabet, Ragnarok, which is their end of the world story, uh, the Nordic tree of life, which is called Yggdrasil, and many other sagas and adventures of the gods. So we're going to see this in other cultures, that other cultures also have their own version of the Hebraic tree of life. But first we're going to start by talking about the runes. And this is what the runes look like. It's the alphabet that was used. Um, and I believe if you remember in Lee's lecture on the five races, the first race, he said protoplasmic race, he said used the runic language. But I don't know if they explained the rune, runic language, but it's what this is. So runes are a form of script that were used in ancient times by the people of Northern Europe. With their roots in Norse mythology, the runes are symbolic in nature. Each rune has a, a, having a spiritual significance. Like Chinese characters, they also form words when they're combined, which have actual meaning in the Germanic language, such as fei, which means cattle. So much like when we saw with the Hebrew culture, where every letter had a spiritual significance attached to it, and then you combine those letters and they made words, same with the runes. The word rune actually means secret, whisper, or mystery. 
Each rune, apart from its literal meaning, has a story attached to it that associates it with a specific Norse god and or legend. So that's where the spiritual significance comes into their letters. Each letter is attributed to a specific either adventure or deity or North god. This is how they were commonly dis displayed. This was a rune stone. You can see the runes are carved in and then all these fancy pictures carved in the middle. So when this ancient script was originated, there was no parchment and was therefore carved into wood and stone. This accounts for its sharp, straight lines. I remember when I heard them say this, I said, well, what about all these curved lines? <laughs> Why are the, and they told me the, the, the language of the runes is much older than even the Germanic. And that's why Lee told you that the protoplasmic race used it. That it was a spiritual language, almost like a golden language, like one of the highest forms of communication. The, uh, the Nordics, they adopted it, but it is much older than their culture alone. Runes are an exemplary achievement in written script, providing a fascinating insight to the world of an ancient people whose lives were uniquely ingrained in the harmony of nature and spirituality. Here we have a picture of Odin, and he's reading the runes. The history of the runes has both a mystical, symbolic root, as well as a literary source. Its mystical ancestry is found in the legend of the chief god Odin, who in his quest for wisdom, discovers the runes. In this legend, Odin acquires the runes by sacrificing himself to himself by hanging on a tree. He was also wounded by a spear while hanging on the same tree. The story is familiar to us with the Jesus story who was hung by the cross and wounded with the spear. There are many similarities between Nordic mythology and Christianity. The two actually fused together at one point when they were spreading north. When Christianity spread north, we'll look at it further, it became intertwined with Nordic mythology. And as we see from the Christmas season, a lot of the things we do in the Christmas season are from North mythology, like the tree, for example, with lights on it. That's a Germanic custom. For them, uh, placing an evergreen in the house was a symbol of uh, ever, like living forever, because all the trees in the, in the forest would die except for the evergreen, was always green throughout the winter seasons and all of this. And they also had a custom with the Yuletide log where they would burn the same piece of wood at, this, at the winter solstice every year. They would keep a chunk of it and burn it again. We've kind of, I don't know if anyone does this in our culture, but we keep it in our songs, the Yuletide log. And also Odin rode a horse that could fly who had eight legs. This has made its way into the Santa Claus myth that we have. But instead of having eight legs, he has eight reindeers. So. Nordic mythology impacts directly our culture, and we don't even know. And we'll see at the end, too, it impacts it even more. The days of, our days of the week are named after Nordic gods. But here's a picture of Odin caught up in the tree carving uh, the runes. Uh, now we're going to look at, this is right from the Poetic Edda, so it's going to be hard, a little bit hard to understand, but this is how it's written, just to give you an example. So this is uh, Odin speaking, who is the chief god of, the North, of Northern mythology. I ween that I hung on the windy tree, hung there for nights full nine. With the spear I was wounded, and offered I was to Odin, myself to myself, on the tree that none may ever know what root beneath it runs. None made me happy with loaf or horn, and there below I looked. I took up the runes, shrieking I took them, and forthwith back I fell. Nine mighty songs I got from the son of Balthorn, Besla's father, and a drink I got of the goodly mead poured out from the Athora. And our Athora is like a cup. Uh, Besla in North mythology is, is uh, Odin's mother. Then I began to thrive and wisdom to get. I grew and well I was. Each word led me on to another word, each deed to another deed. Room shalt thou find in fateful signs that the king of singers colored and the mighty gods have made. Full strong the signs, full mighty the signs, that the ruler of gods doth write. And this is the first liter uh, literary example when we find any mention of the runes or where they came from or where they originated. Um, yeah. This is the runic alphabet. 
There are three known kinds of runic alphabets, which are common in origin and similar in meaning. The elder Futhark, the alphabet is called the Futhark, the elder one being the oldest, is, uh, it's the most common and consists of 24 symbols. The younger Futhark was reduced to 16 symbols, and the Anglo-Saxon Futhark expanded to 33 symbols. This is just as the culture developed, their language changed, so they added letters, they took letters away. Much like we're doing in our culture right now, where we're going to start spelling things weird, like people is going to be PPL, and LOL is going to mean something, and we're just reducing the language. <laughs> so, runes were also used in documents, songs, poems, magic, and divination, usually cut into jewelry and weapons for their protective powers. Here's a ring you see with runes on it. They would often cut the runes into their shields, into their swords. Runes were employed in making talismans, and each rune is associated with a st distinct god, as we said. There was another group who came more recently who re-employed the use of runes because they were trying to get back to their Germanic ancestry. And that group was the Nazis. The swastika is a Nordic rune. The SS bolts are Nordic runes. And uh, basically, if you watch any of the documentaries on the Nazis, they were trying to recreate a religion that was more based on ancient North mythology and to move away from Christianity. So we see that they, they used their symbols and distorted them. These are rune stones. You can see this common people, like uh, commonly people will use them kind of like um, tarot cards. They'll throw them and read them to predict events or future. So divination is just one of the many branches on the tree of rune lore. Many other cultures had different forms of divination, such as the Oracle of Delphi in Greece, the Sacred Tarot in Kabbalah, etc. Uh, runes do not predict the future in the fortune-telling fortune sense, but it is an oracle which gives counsel to the reader, offering an analysis to the problem, as well as possible outcomes and solutions on one's spiritual path, much like tarot cards do. The runic way of life faced near obliteration with the expansion of Christendom. Like most pagan and magical arts at this time, the runic way of life was banned by the church and many rune masters were executed. So you see here, burning at the stakes and trying to convert them, and if they don't convert them, Christianity came with the sword. We, that's what we learned in history class. As Christianity spread north, the sign of the cross often fused with the sign of the hammer. Thor's hammer, and that's, this is an example of that. That's a depiction of Thor's hammer, hammer fused uh, with the cross. Because Christianity was similar in certain aspects to, Nordic, to the Nordic belief system, that they could combine the two. The Nordics were, seemed to be really preoccupied with Ragnarok, the end times. Christianity came and they had revelations, which was very similar, and they thought these books were actually the same. So in Gnostic science, we practice runic judo, which consists of our body taking the form of a runic letter and at the same time pronouncing a mantra that corresponds to that specific runic letter. This is what next week's class is going to be on. So a lot of people like yoga positions, and this is kind of as close to yoga positions as we get in this, uh, in this practice. Um, but because we said the runes are spiritual characteristics that have spiritual qualities. This is, a, this is a way that we utilize them for practice. It's also good to sit, because we've we got to practice many different ways to get many results. Sometimes when you practice just uh, meditation, just sitting and meditating, it's very intellectual, it's very trying to get over your mind. This way it works more of the physical area. It's important to work the different aspects of your body. So there are astrology signs. Yeah, there, there are astrology signs mm -hmm. with them too. So this is another quote from Samael. Before all the languages of the Tower of Babel were scattered upon the face of the earth, only one language, a language of gold, a universal idiom, existed. The letters of that golden language are written within all of nature. Whosoever has studied the Nordic runes and the Hebrew, Chinese, and Tibetan characters will be able to intuit such a cosmic language with its enigmatic letters. So we're seeing there that these ancient cultures, there's something 
uh, special about their, their written language. It's more spiritual in nature. The letters, they represent spiritual ideas, therefore making the whole language more spiritual in nature. So the oldest, the oldest uh, dialects are worth studying. Now we're going to move on to Yggdrasil. A lot of the runic, or er, the, the Nordic words are very difficult to say. <laughs> Number seven, I was getting this ready. So this is a depiction of Yggdrasil, which to the Nordics is the tree of life. It's a tree that's at the center of the universe. And this is again from the, uh, from the Eddas. An ash tree I know, Yggdrasil its name, with water white, is the great tree wet. Thence come the dews that fall in the dales, green by earth's well does it ever grow. Three roots there are, that three ways run, neath the ash tree Yggdrasil. Neath the first lives hell, neath the second the frost giants, neath the last are the lands of men. The ash is the greatest of all trees and best. Its limbs spread out over all the world and stand above heaven. Three roots of the three uphold it and stand exceeding broad. Under the roots is Mimir's well, wherein wisdom and understanding are stored. Thither came Allfather, who was Odin, and craved one drink of the well, but he got it not until he had laid his eye in pledge. So there are some interesting similarities, for sure. Yggdrasil, the, the Nordic tree of life, is supported by three great roots. If we examine the Hebraic tree of life, it has the pillars on the end and the pillar in the center. It's also supported by three great roots. This is a, a depiction of Yggdrasil, more like the Hebraic tree of life. So now you see why we led with all the tree of life nonsense. In Nordic mythology, Yggdrasil is a sacred world tree. Each day in their mythology, the gods are said to ride to Yggdrasil to hold council. Yggdrasil is a central structure that supports the nine worlds, regions, dimensions of the Nordics. These nine worlds are connected by the multiple roots and branches of the tree that are roads which may be traveled between them and the channels through which the forces of each world pass to interact with others. So it's very interesting because now they, we see they have the same knowledge, the same representation that the Hebraic system does. And these cultures are fairly divided. <laughs> so maybe, there is, maybe it is universal knowledge. Thence come the maidens mighty in wisdom, three from the dwelling down neath the tree. Yurth is one named, Verthandi the next, on the wood they scored, and Skald the third. Laws they made there, and life allotted to the sons of men, and set their fates. So under the tree, they're said to live these three women who were called the Norns, whose names were Earth, Yurth, Verthandi, and Skald. Yurth, the actual definition of the name is past and then Rathandi, present, skull, future. So these women were a representation of time. These three wise women were called the Norns, and it was their duty to weave the fates of man and gods. Another depiction of a uh, tree of life. They, broke, they had theirs broken up into nine worlds instead of ten, like you see. They had three in what we would consider a heaven area, Three in what we consider a physical, the physical world area, and three, which would be the underworld. So an eagle sits in the limbs of the ash, and he understanding of many a thing. And between his eyes sits the hawk that is called his name. The squirrel called Rat, that name, runs up and down the length of the ash, bearing envious words between the eagle and Nidhogger, which is the, the serpent, the dragon that lives under the tree. And four hearts, or deer, uh, Dane, Valen, Dunir, and Durathor, bite the leaves. Moreover, so many serpents are, are in, uh, well, this would be the lower level of the tree, is what that word is referring to, that no tongue can tell them. And I, I, I was checking with lots of these scholars, and they, they, they don't know exactly what all that represents. They don't know why they would pick four deers uh, biting at the leaves. We know that in the Hebraic culture, they, they uh, divided it into four worlds that the Tree of Life uh, is part of. And there's supposedly a squirrel 
that runs up and down, saying bad things between the eagle and the serpent. Possibly to represent the fact that the eagle representing the most highest spiritual faculties, the dragon being the lowest, that they can't intermingle. They can never come in contact because they're polar opposites. And so this is their connecting force. More serpents there are beneath the ash than an unwise ape would think. Yggdrasil's ash, great evil, suffers. For more than men do know, the heart bites its top, its trunk is rotting, and the thaw gnaws beneath. So th these, are, these are just times that uh, Yggdrasil is spoken about in the Eddas. And we'll move on to the creation story. In the beginning, there were two unique regions, one of fire and light, where the absolute and eternal being all Fodor, or all father ruled, and the other a region of darkness and cold called Niflheim, ruled by Surtur, the Dark One. Between one region and the other there was chaos. The sparks that escaped from all father fertilized the cold vapors of Niflheim, and Ymir, father of the race, the race of giants, was born. So their creation story says there was two regions that already existed, that they were opposites, and that from these two regions the first creature was ever created. That creature was a giant man. Much like the, the Hebrews said with their protoplasm of man or their, their, their idea of uh, Adam. So to nourish him in the same manner, the cow Adhumbla was created, from whose udder flowed the four rivers of milk. Satiated, Ymir fell asleep, and from the sweat of his hands a giant couple was born, male and female and from one of his feet, a monster with six heads. So now when we look at Nordic knowledge, we think, this is strange. <laughs> what does it mean? What are they trying to tell us? We're back living and trying to figure out riddles and rhymes. But if we take it from a Gnostic sense, are they telling us something? They're saying that there was one being, and from that being, other beings came. A male and a female from the one being. So one being separated into two sexes, and from his feet a monster with six heads was born. The, the monster with six heads is like the seal of Solomon, and we'll, we'll, look, we'll look at that a little further in about a minute, I believe. Yes. So in this story of creation we discover the alchemical process. The fire unites with the waters of the chaos. The masculine creative principle unites with the feminine receptive principle. Uh, to bring forth life. So two opposites, fire and water combined, life comes, for, comes forth. This life is nourished by and saturated with the milk of a sacred cow, which is representative of the creative energy or of the Divine Mother. The first creation is the giant Ymir, the inner god of every human being, the master. So Ymir sleeps, and from his sweat, a giant couple is born, male and female, the sublime and giant primeval divine hermaphrodite, the first race, the protoplasmic race. So we're, trying, so we're deciphering here that the Nordics had some kind of understanding of the races that preceded, that the races came, then were wiped away, and then another race came, and the races all came from, the, from a common source. From the feet of Ymir, the six-headed monster was born the Star of Solomon, the sexual alchemy of the human being, which, after many centuries, ends up in the separation or division of the giants, transforming, in, transforming them into human beings of separate sexes. Now, this idea you can remember from Lee's lectures on the seven races, how it's one thing, and then it becomes androgynous, hermaphroditic, eventually splits into two separate sexes over millions of years until we, we come to where we are now, two separate sexes. The Star of Solomon represents the two opposite creative forces combined together. This is the positive and negative, male and female, etc. So the six-headed monster, as a representation of the seal of Solomon, is, is the sexual dilemma. The, the merging of the fire and the water, the male and the female. Then Odin and his brothers, they kill Ymir, and from his body create the physical world. 
Out of Ymir's flesh was fashioned the earth, and the mountains were made of his bones, the sky from the frost-cold giant skull, and the ocean out of his blood. So, this, this is what we're talking about when we say that it seems like the stories were written for people who had some background in what the stories were talking about. Because if you just read it, it seems strange. It seems hard to understand exactly what they're talking about. But we know that if we look at it Kabbalistically, from the Tree of Life point of view, it tells us that the world starts here, and then it funnels down until physical, to the physical world. The same idea is being expressed here, that there was spiritual principles, and then these spiritual principles, through whichever story that Odin and his brothers killed it, and it becomes the physical world. That was their mythology. And this is interesting too because the Nordics also have their own Adam and Eve. In Norse mythology, the first human beings created by the gods were Ask or Asgir and Embla. So not only do they have Adam and Eve, but the names are also very similar. Uh, Ask, a man, and Embla, a woman, were made by the principal god Odin and his brothers Vili and Ve in the peaceful time after the gods had defeated the first being of creation, Ymir. When the sons of Bor, which are Odin and his brothers, were walking along the sea strand, they found two trees and took up the trees and shaped men of them. The first gave them spirit and life, the second wit and feeling, the third from speech, hearing, and sight. They gave them clothing and names. The male was called Asgir and the female Embla, and of them was mankind begotten, which received a dwelling place under Midgard. So the gods here create a male and female, and they say from this male and female, the whole world was populated, almost identical to the Adam and Eve story of the Old Testament. Now we're going to look at the chief god, Odin. So Odin was the king of the gods. He had two black ravens, uh, Hugin, which means thought, and Munin, which means memory. They flew forth daily to gather tidings of events all over the world. Then they flew this information back to Odin as a symbol of him being all-knowing and omnipresent. Odin's prized possessions are his ring, Drapnir, and his spear, Gungnir. We know that these symbols are, are deeply alchemical, the spear being a phallic symbol and the, the ring being uh, the symbol of the yoni, the feminine symbol. Odin rides the best of all steeds, the eight-legged Sleipnir, which is his horse, eight legs. Odin was also the god of wisdom, poetry, and magic, and he sacrificed an eye for the privilege of drinking from Mimir, the fountain of wisdom. The cult of Odin, the chief of the gods, may have spread from western Germany to Scandinavia shortly before the myths were recorded. So for them, Odin was like the Christ figure. He was their main uh, god. Now we're going to have a look at Odin's quest for the runes. One day, Odin rode his white horse, Sleipnir, until he reached the world ash tree, Yggdrasil. There he saw three women sitting at the well, the Norns that we talked about previously. They were busy spinning threads and weaving the garment of fate for gods and men. Thereupon, the three women revealed to the god Odin many secrets of the distant past and foretold the far-off future. So Odin's quest was a quest for supreme knowledge. But the god was eager to learn, to learn even more about the worlds. So the women referred him to the giant Mimir, who dwells at the spring of wisdom, whose nourishing liquid feeds the world tree. But under that root which turns toward the rim giants is Mimir's well, wherein wisdom and understanding are stored. And he is called Mimir who keeps the well. He is full of ancient lore, since he drinks of the well from... This is like his cup. Thither came all father and craved one drink of the well, but he got it not until he had laid his eye in pledge. Now we see another interesting concept coming up by the Nordics, that their wisdom came from a, a sacred water, a sacred well. We understand that Gnostically to be the sexual energy. And this is what they were depicting through their myths. Odin rode to the god Mimir, 
but Mimir did not want to give his knowledge so easily. Therefore Odin pledged his left eye to the Mighty One. Then Mimir serves Odin a draught from his wondrous fountain of wisdom. The price demanded for this privilege was one eye, symbolizing the sacrifice of one view for another greater vision. It's hard to say, well, why did he have to give an eye to have a drink from the fountain of life? It's symbolic that he had to sacrifice. He had to make physical sacrifices to gain spiritual knowledge, which is basically well, what this group is about. It's what we're kind of teaching about meditation. That's a, that's a physical sacrifice. You can do lots of, you can be doing lots of things tonight, but you're here. This is a sacrifice. To gain knowledge, a sacrifice has to be given. This is their, their way of showing an eye was to show that a physical sacrifice was given to learn spiritual knowledge. Still, Odin was not fully satisfied in his quest for wisdom. On the way back through the desolate heath, he came upon a leafless tree. It was the fog moon, and the frosty twilight permeated the landscape. Suddenly, his coat was caught in the branches of the tree. Odin hung between heaven and earth. In vain, he tried to free himself. Odin's white horse slept near, circled around him, whining. His ravens, Hugin and Munin, thought and memory, flew around him agitatedly and brought the world's thoughts to him. So Odin's still looking for knowledge. He's riding along and he gets caught in a tree, sticks in between heaven and earth. This is a representation that he was uh, going to the higher dimensions, that he was caught in between heaven and earth on the tree of life. Odin struggled with himself for the ultimate wisdom. Nine nights he hung on the wind strip on the windswept tree. His inner being gradually grew clearer and more luminous. Now he finally found the symbols of life's noblest values. He bent down deeply from the tree, greening, uh, groaning with extreme exertion. He took up the signs, the runes, and cut them into the trunk with his sword. Now a lot of the information here is symbolic. He he hung on the tree for nine nights, referring to the ninth Sifiroth. The Sifiroth of Yisod, Yisod, the foundation stone, the, what we know to be like the alchemical stone, the philosopher's stone, the work in the alchemical, like the alchemical work. Rune he called these sacred glyphs because they whisper wisdom to the initiated. Now Skyfather was possessed by the mighty ability to free himself from the tree. He fell down, jumped up, called his steed and rode back to Valhalla, the castle of the gods. Odin, who was also called Wotan in like, English communities, proceeded to initiate his divine companions into the lore of the runes. He also gave this gift to his most loyal men, men who lived according to his laws and fought alongside him for the cosmic universal order and against the dark forces. Chosen women were also instructed in the runic arts by the god. Now the signs became the sacred writing of the Germanic people. So this, was, this, this is the spiritual side of where the runes came from. This is the story of how the runes became the language of the Germanic people. This whole Odin's quest for knowledge, he finds it at the fountain, the fountain of youth, meaning that he partook of using, utilizing the sacred energies. Now we'll look at the Ragnarok, which is a really interesting story of North mythology, one they were very preoccupied with. They were all interested in the events of the end of the world. So Ragnarok in North mythology was the predestined death of the Germanic gods. In the end it was believed the forces of chaos will outnumber and overcome the divine and human guardians of order. Ragnarok marks the end of the old world and the beginning of the new better world which will emerge from the ashes of the old one. So they believed that there was going to be a, a huge battle between the forces of light and the forces of darkness. They, they believed that, that at some time the forces of darkness would, would grow so, so great that all the valiant soldiers would have to come out of Valhalla from the highest realms, fight these forces. And they also believed that they would, that they would eliminate the dark forces, but also all the gods themselves would also be eliminated. So this is also from the Eddas. There shall come that winter which is called the Awful Winter. In that time snow shall dry from all quarters. Frost shall be great then, and winds sharp. There shall be no virtue in the sun. Those winters shall proceed three in succession, and no summer between. 
But first shall come three other winters, such that over all the world there shall be mighty battles. In that time brothers shall slay each other for greed's sake, and none shall spare father or son in manslaughter and in incest. So, so it says in uh, Balaspa, which is one of the books of the Eddas, Brothers shall strive and slaughter each other. Own sisters, children shall sin together. Uh, ill days among men, many a whoredom, an axe age, a sword age, shields shall be cloven, a wind age, a, wind age, a wolf age, ere the world totters. So, so when they're talking about this awful winter, are they talking about an actual physical winter that's going to come? No, they're, they're talking about the state of humanity. It would be like a winter. It's expressed other ways, like, like the Iron Age. In this movie, you hear them talk about the Iron Age. They talk about it as, a, as an awful winter. And you can see that uh, where, the, where the eagle is very strong, uh, where the brothers shall slay each other for greed's sake, none shall spare father or son in manslaughter or in incest. Uh, and also, we can take from it, too, that Ragnarok comes on, or begins, and because of, it seems like from here, there's also, because of a sexual degeneration, it seems like. Because ill days among men, many a whoredom, own sisters' children shall sin together. So, somehow they connected the sexual degeneration with the beginning of the end of the world. So Rimmer, the Frost Giant, and his innumerable companions have to embark on a colossal ship in order to destroy the gods in their happy and resplendent abode, Valhalla, and the universe. This terrible, reproachful ship, which is made only of the nails of the dead, never cut by any merciful soul, advances and grows in spite of the smallness of the material, until the corruption reaches its limit. Then the monsters whom the gods had managed to enchain break the chains which bind them. The mountains sink, the jungles are uprooted, the wolves who since the beginning of the world have howled at the sun and the moon now reach them and consume them once and for all. This idea of all these demons coming on this boat from the underworld is like the rise of the ego. That the ego is really strong amongst humanity. <coughs> and there's also, it, it's very interesting the way they describe it. The jungles are uprooted, uh, the mountains sink. It sounds almost like a polar shift or something like this. They've had knowledge of great uh, cataclysms of the past. The wolf furnace breaks his bonds and assails the world with open jaws, reaching the sky with one jaw and the earth with the other, and would open them even wider, but there is no space. The serpent of Midgard floods all the earth. The frost giants come in their ship of nails. At high noon, the powers of the destructive fire draw nearer. Loki, the Surda, and the sons of Mitzvahim come to fight the final decisive battle. So these are the main enemies in Ragnarok. Was the wolf Fenris, uh, the sea serpent that came out of the water to destroy them, and those monsters representing the, the ego. We'll have a look at it. a little bit more. The, div the divinities of Valhalla prepare to receive the enemy. Their watchman Heimdall, posted at the entrance to the bridge, that leads to their dwelling, sounds the clarion, and the gods, in union with the souls of the heroes who have died in battle, go out to receive the giants. The battle begins and ends with the destruction of both armies, with the death of the gods and of the giants. The incandescence of those of the fire spread over the world so that all is consumed in an immense purifying holocaust. So in their mythology, this was the battle to end all battles, the supreme battle between light and darkness, where both forces end up being destroyed. Now we're just going to look at the symbology a little bit. In Nordic tradition, Ragnarok, which is their apocalypse, begins because of the great whoredom of mankind. The world is created sexually, and this world is destroyed when the human being becomes a terrible fornicator, when the great whore has reached the breaking point of her corruption. That is, when the serpent of Midgard floods the entire earth. The serpent of Midgard is a representation of the Kunda buffer that has been developed by mankind as a result of fornication and the misuse of the creative energies. The serpent of Midgard is further connected to the sexual waters by the fact that it is said to come out of the sea and to flood the earth. The wolf 
furnace, whose jaws reach both heaven and earth, is the Nordic representation of karma. At the times of the end, all the karma that has been accumulated by mankind breaks its bonds and is dispensed to all. This karma affects both mankind and the gods. If you remember from previous lectures, Lee talked about the many different forms of karma and that gods also acquire karma or the divinities aren't free from karma. So this was the representation of the wolf. This is why his jaws reach the sky and the earth. I had a dream like when Lee was teaching one of the classes about a wolf coming like we were in a swimming pool and there was a wolf came to the water and I told this girl we had to get out. So yeah, yeah. he didn't tell me it was for, but Nordic karma, yeah. Yep, that's in the... Uh, yeah, that's, that's really good. Maybe karma's coming. Did you write that? Yeah. Well, yeah, I wrote that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, well, there, there's other cultures with wolves and, and dogs and other things. Like, the most famous one would be Cerberus, the three-headed dog. And he was a representation of um, the, uh, the sexual potency. Yeah, that's what Lee said. So right. Wolves were like a sexual image. Yeah, yeah. Like animal distinction. And the fact that the water is also in your dream might be connected water. to that. Yeah, the yeah, water. yeah. Water. Yeah, water. Yeah, it makes sense. Water. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you think about fire? <laughs> no fire. No. So the ship of nails carrying the giants in the army of the dead represents the pluralized eye of the ego, the multitude of the psychological aggregates. So now we see that that the three enemies of humanity during their apocalypse was the ego, the kunda buffer, and also karma. And they told it in this very elaborate story-like way. Which, if you have an oral tradition, it's best to keep your information in like a story or a fairy tale. We do the same thing. We keep important information. We hand it down to our children in fairy tale form. Even if we don't understand what we're telling them, at least we remember the story we tell it to them. They hear it and maybe it speaks to them deeper. Uh, and now this is, this is from one of the Eddas, and it talks about what happens after Ragnarok. So the, the one uh, God says to the other, Shall any of the gods live then, or shall there be then any earth or heaven? Har answered, In that time the earth shall emerge out of the sea, and shall then be green and fair. Then shall the fruits of it be brought forth unsown. In the place called Hadramir's Holt, there shall lie hidden during the fire of Surtur two of mankind who are called thus, Leif and Leif Razir. And for food they shall have the morning dews, and from these folks shall come so numerous an offspring that all the world shall be peopled, even as is said here. Leif and Leif Razer shall, uh, these shall lurk hidden in the hold of Hadmamir, which is one of the ways they say Yggdrasil, the tree of life. The morning dews their meat shall be, thence are gendered the generations. So there's a, so there's a huge fight, a destruction, the world sinks, the world reemerges from the water, two people are left, they repopulate. Here. It's almost like a second Adam and Eve story. Symbolic more than literal, I would think. The Vikings were particularly interested in Ragnarok, and many of the Germanic peoples believed the same type of battle would again occur. Even when Christianity began to take over their belief system, many of them still explored the idea of a judgment day in the same light as Ragnarok. So they saw the book of Revelations, the Judgment Day, as the Ragnarok. So for them, they, they, could, uh, they could relate to Christianity on certain levels. Because when Christianity first came, it was like Roman Catholicism, right? So instead of having many gods or many deities, they had all these saints you could pray to that were the same. There are other higher beings, they were all saints. If you, St. Patrick, so a whole army of saints instead of army of gods. They had their own Judgment Day. So it is interesting to look at it from that, because as Christianity become, moves further and further away, they also start, they've been separating from those ideas. They've been focusing mostly on Jesus, and now certain Christian groups, they say, no, there's no saints. There's, some of them don't even have any importance on Mary or the Divine Mother. This is another interesting story that exists in Nordic mythology, the Golden Apples. So... Uh, there exists a goddess whose name is Idun, whose name means she who rejuvenates. Idun possessed golden apples which she carried in a casket. Every day she offered these apples to the gods, which granted them eternal life and youth. 
Since not all the gods were immortal, the apples helped them ward off the approach of old age and disease and remain vigorous, beautiful, and young throughout the countless ages. When Loki, through trickery, kidnapped Edun, the gods noticed her absence immediately as they became weak and as frail as mortals without the magic fruit. The idea of apples that exists, we know in the Old Testament, Adam and Eve, they eat the forbidden apple. This apple has the same connotation. It means the same thing as in uh, the Old Testament. That instead of them eating the forbidden fruit, the gods are using the golden apple. They're, they're using the creative energy the proper way. This is what keeps them gods, the creative energy. And then when the creative energy, symbolized by the apples, is gone, they become weak as mortals. They become just like regular people. So there's some interesting knowledge hidden there. This is Hel, who in Nordic mythology is a uh, is one of one of their gods, and one of the things that Christianity has in it as well, the idea of Hel. So in Nordic mythology, Hel was the goddess of the dead. She dwelt beneath one of the three roots of the sacred ash tree Yggdrasil. She was one of three children of Loki, the god of mischief, the other two being the wolf Fenrir and the serpent, who we talked about in Ragnarok. Odin, the Allfather, hurled Hel into Niflheim, the realm of cold and darkness, itself also known as Hel, over which he gave her sovereign authority. So we see in Nordic mythology there is an underworld that's called Hel, and it's ruled by a goddess whose name is Hel. So Anger Boda was the name of a certain giantess with whom Loki got three children. One was the Fenris wolf, the second was uh, the sea serpent, that is the Midgard serpent, the third is Hel. All Father sent gods thither to take the children and bring them to him. When they came to him straight away, he cast the serpent into the deep sea, where he lies all about the land. And this serpent grew so greatly that he lies in the midst of the ocean, encompassing all the land, and bites upon his own tail. Hell he cast into Niflheim, and gave to her power over nine worlds, to apportion all abodes among those that were sent to her. That is, she has the power over men dead of sickness or of old age. She has great possessions there. Her walls are exceeding high, and her gates great. Her hall is called sleep cold, her dish hunger. Famine is her knife, pit of stumbling her threshold, by which one enters. Disease her bed, gleaming bale, her bed hangings. She is half blue, black, and half flesh colored, and very lowering and fierce. So we see that this goddess Hell is very much related to what we subconsciously think of when we think of the devil or Satan. It's the same. She rules in she rules the infernal dimensions, and uh, it's pretty interesting. Now, on a lighter note, we're going to look at horned helmets. <laughs> So we'll start with a joke, I guess, after talking about hell and the end of the world. Uh, so as we approach shore, we will start to move. By the time they realize it isn't a shipload of dairy cattle, it'll be too late. And that's the origin of Viking helmets. <laughs> By Dan Piero. Okay. So. There is no historical evidence that Vikings actually wore horned helmets into battle. However, historical and archaeological evidence indicates that priests among the Norse and earlier Germanic peoples may have worn headgear with horns in religious ceremonies. Richard Wagner is often credited with popularizing the idea of horned helmets. His operatic cycle, Der Ring des Nibelungen, which was first produced between 1869 and 1876, depicted Germanic gods and heroes in the mythical past. It was the opera where you always see it in cartoons where the woman's oh, wearing yeah. the horns and singing. The opera, yeah. 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 This is where we get our idea of Vikings. It's from yeah. uh, an opera mm -hmm. that was made in the 1800s, the mid-1800s. Mm -hmm. So that, that's more of a myth that they wore horned helmets into battle because they wouldn't really be too practical. I mean, if you came upon an enemy and you had a horned helmet, you could just grab it, chop your head off or whatever. But they said, for some reason, our culture, that's how we picture the Vikings in North mythology with horned helmets. And it's all from an operatic play. But there are other examples of horns in spirituality throughout history. 
So does anyone know who this is a depiction of? Moses. It is a depiction of Moses. Moses. The tablets of Allah. He's often depicted like this with horns coming out of his head. There's statues by Michelangelo where Moses is standing there with horns. So what's that writing on there? Is that... This is the Ten Commandments that oh. came down from uh, Mount Sinai. So horns have been used in religious imagery by many diverse groups throughout history. Uh, when Moses descended from Mount Sinai with the tablets of the law on his head, he had two horns, two rays of light resembling horns. For that reason, he has always been represented with two horns. These horns represent the potency of the creative energies. It was like in, in a more ancient way of showing how in Christianity they show people with a halo to show that they're illuminated. They used to show it with horns. And there's other examples of that throughout history, but I think people start to associate horns with negative things like the devil or something, so they change it to halos. Here we see we have Isis. And she's the horned goddess. So in Egyptian tradition, we find Isis, the horned goddess. She is the divine mother, the representation of the sacred fire that exists in each of us, the kundalini. As a depiction of the kundalini, we can see how Isis is also related to the potency of the creative energies. Here we have uh, in Hinduism, they had the same idea, but they represented it as uh, the sacred cow. So the Hindu tradition, we find the same representation of the creative energies in the form of the sacred cow. So it's, it's a horned cow instead of a horned person. But the representation is the same. The sacred cow symbolizes Isis, the Divine Mother, and her calf represents uh, Mercury, the messenger of the gods, the Kabir, the Logos. Or a more easy way of understanding would be like, uh, the cow represents the Divine Mother, and the calf represents like the Christ, like Mary and Christ, or the, or the ca sacred cow and the sacred calf. It's all the same imagery. The Nordics, we remember, they also had their sacred cow, who was named Adhumla, who was the primeval cow and whose milk the giant Ymir fed on. So these are other representations of uh, horned beings in spirituality. You see there's Odin. He was, he was drawn with horns sometimes, or there were wings in the shape of horns. This is uh, the high priest, this is uh, the tarot, the divine mother, represented by horns. This is uh, the baffle may image that was uh, associated with the Knights Templar and some of the Masonic uh, bodies, which is also a spiritual drawing, even though it looks evil. Because uh, you know, the flame in the center is like knowledge. The horns and the goat head is the potency of the sexual energy. You see that the, the, the white moon above the dark moon. And if you look close in this image, it's something that a lot of people miss, is that there's a strange phallic image in the center. There's the phallic rod, coming up from the center, the two serpents intertwined around it, and like a yoni, like a, the, the symbol of the female uterus also. So it's also an alchemical picture. And it, it, it's interesting that we use horns to represent spiritual uh, ideas throughout history. What are the two things he's standing on right there? What is like this? Yeah. It's like a mountaintop. So it's actually just like... Oh, those are his feet? They look like birds or something? I'm they're right. like they're like goat hooves. Okay. What does it say? I guess it says something. It does say something on his arms, but I'm not particularly familiar with what it is. This was drawn in um, the 1800s. And then, and then through certain uh, anti-Masonic literature, they put this picture connected with the Knights Templar, and it's always just kind of stuck with, with masonry. But it was, it was drawn by a Catholic priest, actually, who was also an occultist and, and a master. So it had a really deep significance that isn't really grasped today. We just look at it and think it's like a devil picture. But it's a picture of baffle me. And this is the uh, other modern influence I was talking about. We're going to talk. The day, certain days of our week are named after Nordic gods. Monday is Moon's Day. Tuesday is Tears Day, who is a Nordic god. Uh, he's, he was in one of the pictures, he has one, one hand. Uh, Wednesday is like saying Odin's Day or Wo Woden's Day. Thursday is the one we know the most, Thor's Day. 
Friday, Frig or Freya's day, and Sunday is the Sun's day. Where's Saturday? Yeah, the North didn't have any Saturday, oh. so I'm not Saturn sure where we got it. Saturn, Saturn. <laughs> is where we get it from, so it wasn't really influenced by the Nordic tradition. <laughs> so that's interesting about that, and uh, that pretty much brings us to the conclusion. So. So if there are any questions, we can take questions. Or if you guys Who was want Freya? Did we go over that? No, we didn't get into too many of the Nordic gods, but that's what the next lecture is because we talk more about the runic practices and who the gods are. But the whole study of Nordic mythology is huge. We'd be like trying to sit down and give you a lecture on Greek mythology. It <laughs> can't be done. So. So yeah. So,